apologize. I had other plans for someone to be here to take over for me. Um, I am Farah Marvel, and I am Tassada's daughter, and we are actually sort of, um, I guess you could say we're pinch hitting for a friend who just said, hey, we've got the space for Islam, and would you guys be willing to come in? And I said, absolutely, and so did dad. So um, hope for Ishmael, if you guys are even, um, I don't know how to actually even get a I was going to do a poll to see how many people even have heard of uh, my dad's um, my oh I'm seeing some more people entering the room polling to see if anybody had already um, heard my dad's testimony read his book um, that would be once an era fat man um, and or the mind of terror which kind of outlines a little bit of who we are. Um, if you haven't, you can definitely check both of those out on Amazon. But one of the main things that we discuss is um, first the roots of where is Islam and why, why Ishmael. And dad does a really kind of in-depth teaching on Ishmael for our Lead with Love program. Um, our Lead with Love program is like eight-week course that we kind of do. It's almost like foreign missions training for non-foreigners or non, non-foreign non missionaries, but to do taking the best of foreign mission training and doing it here in the United States, basically. So I'm going to let dad um, kind of go over for the first 20 minutes our philosophy on Ishmael and because um, it has a lot to do with his testimony as well. And um, then he can kind of give a brief synopsis of his own testimony and then kind of take some questions from there. Um, and I will do the best I can to moderate. Um, I'm going to have to step out for a second, but I will be right back. And um, then we'll take questions and then we'll talk about what's going on with Muslim ministry here in the United States and why we're focused on here in the United States. And then, of course, abroad as well in Europe and things like that. So um i see we've got earl i'm guessing that's earl and um is that tom is that you or I don't, I don't, okay and um we actually do this on a regular basis with our lead with love and so it's kind of weird to do it with people's names i like having video up so if you're if you're okay with having video up it's nice to see faces and to be able to talk to and kind of get that feedback, even if you're just shaking your head, it's great. So if you're if you're one of those people who just needs to listen and be hanging out, that's totally fine. But if you wanna turn on your camera, that would be great. Um, and then, so I'm gonna hand it off to dad. Thanks Farah, thanks honey. Hi everybody, it's good to be with you and, and thank you very much for inviting us uh, to Mission Connection. Um, what happened here? The screen went out. Or the picture. Anyway, is everybody hearing me? Anybody hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, okay. So just want to make sure that everybody is hearing. Uh, my name is Tassara. That's my short name. It's making uh, easier for me and for everybody. My real name is too complicated. And uh, I'm a Palestinian native. Uh, I grew up in Saudi Arabia and in Qatar. And at the age of 17 and a half, I joined Yasser Arafat forces and started uh, 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 trained eventually as an assassin and uh, came to America in 1974 after decided I don't want to have anything to do with, with the assassination work. And uh, came to America and liked America and the American people, which surprised me because I thought Americans hated us. And so, excuse me. And so, <clears throat> I got married and uh, 19 years in the business, restaurant business and hotel business become very successful. And 19 years later, through a relationship that I had with a, with a friend who was my customer actually become my friend, led me to Christ. 
through reading to me from John 1.1, 1, 1, and then uh, uh, the word of God came alive and took me over, and I had a light speaking to me saying, I'm Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that naturally transformed my life and was never the same again and never looked back as 27 years ago. As uh, I began to study the Bible, it was surprising to me to find out more about my ancestry as a son of Ishmael from the Bible than I did through the Islamic scripture. I was a Muslim. And, and that was surprising to me and exciting too, to know who I was in Christ. And, and that the Lord had something in the Bible in the Old Testament in Genesis uh, about Ishmael. And when I read Genesis uh, 16, 17, and 21, that began really a drive to understand how can I reach uh, other Muslims for Christ through our testimony naturally and the work that the Lord have done in my life through studying the, the Bible and studying Genesis 16, 17, and 21. So let me just take you back in a history of the roots of the conflict between Arabs and Jews. Uh, the roots starts from Genesis 16, when, when Sarah, which her name was Sarah, uh, stopped waiting on God and decided to offer her her maidservant, Hagar, to be Abraham's wife. And, and as we read the scripture, I hope someday you will read my book, The Mind of Terror, which explains all the ones in Arafat man, which explains or gives a, a much deeper teaching on the, on the roots of the conflict between Arabs and Jews. You know, most people think the conflict between Arabs and Jews started when the Jews returned to the promised land. And that is really a, a wrong assumption. The conflict between us and Jews have been for 4,200 years when that particular scripture, Genesis 16, when Sarah decided not to wait on God and to give Abraham Hagar as her, her, his wife. Now, as in the scripture, it says his wife, which surprised me because at that time there are, you know, Abraham had some concubines, he had some servants, more females, that he had relationship with. Why did the Bible say his wife? That, that really touched me. That's because I, I came to understand later that it's because God wanted to make sure Ishmael was going to be coming soon, uh, is not going to be illegitimate son but truly the son of Abraham. And, and uh, so as we look at the scripture, uh, Genesis 16, and we go further, uh, it says Abraham slept with Hagar and she was pregnant or she conceived. And when she got pregnant, she's with the baby. Naturally, she started, she's disobeying Sarah. You know, her position, Hagar's position, as, as Sarah's servant did not change. But as a wife of Abraham, naturally had its own privileges, but she was still Abra Sarah's servant. And so she started disobeying Sarah. Sarah went to Abraham, Abraham, I put this woman in your arms and now that she's pregnant, she disobey me. May the Lord judge between me and you. Sarah is saying to Abraham, Abraham sent it back to him, her and said, look, she's your servant. Go and do whatever, whatever you want. So Sarah goes back and she started abusing Hagar. Hagar in Genesis uh, 16, 7, uh, we'll find that Hagar packed and ran away. And the Bible says the angel of the Lord appeared to Hagar in the desert. 
and and I'm reading. I, I did not really even understand that the angel of the Lord was actually Jesus himself until my wife brought that to my attention. She said, do you realize that this is the Lord himself because it's written in capital? I said, no, I didn't know that. So I began to look deeper into that and realize, yeah, the Lord himself appeared to Hagar in the desert. And he asked her question, where have you come from and where are you going? As if he didn't know. Look how humble our God is. So Hagar was honest. She said, I ran away from my mistress, Sarai. And the Lord said to her, go back and submit to your mistress for you are pregnant with a child. And he began to name him. He said, you are to name him Ishmael. So Ishmael in Hebrew, Ishmael, and in Arabic, Ismail. And two words in one. Uh, uh, the first one is uh, uh, Shema, which Hebrew may word for hear, and El from Elohim, which God, uh, God hears. And that was a judgment on Abraham and Sarah for that name. And he said that this man will be a wild donkey of a man. Oh, man, I read that and I flipped. Now, being a Middle Eastern, you know, uh, you call anybody a, a donkey in the Middle East, and you end up lose some tooth. And uh, I was getting mad. I got up and I threw the Bible all across the room and said, oh, "Forget it! I don't want to have anything to do with this. This is a confused God." First, He says He made us in His own image, and now He calls us donkeys. No way! And I was mad, and I walked away, and and. But the Lord did not leave me and keep drawing me back. So I went to look into what is the wild donkey. And I found out that the wild donkey actually, uh, what the Lord meant is really an honoring name. I found out that in the Old Testament, they've named animals as an honoring name or titles. And, and so that encouraged me a lot. And, uh, and so I went on after, and the other thing is that, that uh, Hagar, at the end of that chapter 16, she said to the Lord, now I see the Lord that sees me, the God that sees me. And I thought, my goodness, she was face to face with him. And, and I thought, wait a minute. I thought God said to, uh, to uh, Moses, no God, no man sees face and live, says my face and live. But here he is face to face with Hagar. Now that was encouraging to me as a son of Ishmael. So we go to Genesis 17. And now the Lord is appearing to Abraham and uh, uh, makes the promises of circumcision. And, uh, and, and then he tells him this time next year, your wife, Sarah, after naming her name from Sarai to Sarah and Abram to Abraham. Uh, your wife, Sarah, will give you a son this time next year. And Abraham fell on his face and cried out to God that Ishmael might live under his blessing. And God said, yes, but my covenant will be with Isaac. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. He will be the father of 12 ruler. And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, what is this 12 ruler? So I started looking into, and then realized that the Arab nations, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Iraq, Kuwait, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates, that's seven nations together or seven tribes together, makes up that 12 tribes of Ishmael that God have promised to promise to bless Ishmael. Now, was his blessing, promise of blessing, the wealth and the land and all that he's given them now that they have? I realize that the Lord is saying, no, it is salvation through my son, Jesus Christ, as such as this at this time. And that's when I realized that I began to research. I thought I was the only Muslim 
that had a vision and have converted from Islam to Christianity. And, and so I started researching and found out that so many Muslims, Ishmaelites in particular, the Lord has been appearing to in, in visions and dreams. And that is really not to say that we are anything special. I believe God has a plan, have a plan for our time at the time that we're living today. And I, I, I long to see the day when we are reconciled with the Jews and we are together as one. Now we see so many uh, nations are joining in with Israel, which is exciting to me. Now we go to Genesis 21, and that's when it really the conflict began uh, deeper. In Genesis 21, Ishma, Isaac is now three years old, and uh, it's the Chaldeans' uh, tradition at the time to give a party to a son when he's three years old. So Abraham was giving a party to Isaac, for Isaac. And Ishmael is standing out on the side or wherever he was at the time. And obviously the Bible said he was mocking Isaac. I began to look into what the rabbis saying. The rabbis were saying that Ishmael, uh, Ishmael was showing jealousy towards towards Isaac. And I thought, oh my God. So Sarah heard Ishmael making fun of Isaac. And so she went to Abraham and said, Abraham, the son of the slave woman and his mother will not, or the son of the slave woman will not share in the inheritance of my son, Isaac. He and his mother must go. Abraham was troubled as his son. 13 years old, or at that time, 16 and a half years old, actually, when he was, uh, uh, anyway, it was 13 and a half, 17 years old at the time, according to the word of God, and if calculating, if we calculate. So, <clears throat> Abraham was troubled, and God appeared to him and said to him, do as Sarah said. I got so mad when I heard, when I read that I throw it again throw the Bible across the room. I don't want to have anything to do with it. This is this is nonsense and and I was mad. But the Lord in His grace and His mercy continued to draw me back to read more, and I went back and I read the rest of what the Lord was saying to Abraham because I stopped at the time where God is saying to Abraham. Do as Sarah said. I didn't read the rest that says, I will look after the boy. But as I was reading that and I'm, I'm visualizing, we visualize a lot when we read something. We visualize, I was visualizing Ishmael walking away into the desert with his mother without a donkey to ride or just walking into the desert. And Ishmael stopping and looking back at his father and then walking back, walking, continues to walk. And uh, my heart was so broken for Ishmael at the time that his own father threw him out of the house, basically. And so I, I thought, if this happens nowadays, how would that son look at his father and what would he do? And so the conflict between Arabs and Jews goes back that long. And the sons of Ishmael are feeling rejected and sent away with a lot of pain that continues. Uh, I don't know if the descendants of Ishmael, I didn't know this story until I read it in the Bible. So obviously most of the Muslims, most of the Arabs don't even know that story. but. Praise God that I was able to read that and was able to, to uh, bring it out to her and share it with, the, with Jewish believers and, and wrote it in my book, The, the Once an Arafat Man. And so praise God for, for his mercy that he gave me the time to continue to develop and call me into the ministry 
in the Gaza Strip, in the West Bank, in Israel, and God is now calling us back to the United States to bring up, to help churches, basically, how to reach your Muslim neighbors in love and respect. With the number of Muslims that are coming to the United States and to Europe uh, and continues to come, uh, I, I realized that church is not quite ready and that we, we came back, my wife and I, to start training and, and Farah, of course, leading all of that work. She's the boss. I'm just the guy that hangs out. So honey, it's um, back to you now. I know that some people were kind of just jumping in um, randomly, but is there anybody who has any questions? Have there been any kind of burning questions in your mind, even as um, you've been thinking about the Muslim world? Um, why does Ishmael, you know, tie into this? And um, I will say that, you know, there is a lot of discussion about Ishmael's place in the Muslim world and why um, the, the teaching in the Muslim world is that Ishmael was the sacrificed son, not Isaac, um, you know, all of those things. That's the most commonly um, expressed reason why Ishmael is a part of the whole conversation. Um, but there is some, some archeological evidence to show that Ishmael is very distantly related to Muhammad. He is in the same, from the same tribe. And so there's a lot of, um, but as far as being a patriarch of Islam, Ishmael doesn't have as much of a prominent place as even um, Isa or Jesus does, or he, and of course, Muhammad. So, um, but just as dad has laid out Ishmael historically to us spiritually, um, we now know the spiritual ramifications of that rejection. And we see exactly the prophesying of what Ishmael's descendants would become and how that has played out in the Middle East against Israel. And so, um, does anybody have any questions about even even the Middle East crisis with the the issue between Israel and Palestine? Because we we served in Jericho and in Gaza for close to fifteen years, and we learned a lot. But we also had a lot of relationships with the Messianic um, uh, side in in the Israeli territory. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I'm going to try and uh, I, I'm pretty sure everybody can actually. I can't tell if it if everybody can unmute themselves if they have a question, um, or even put it in the chat. Um, if not, then I'll just kind of we'll move on to the reason why. And it go ahead. I've got the chat room up, so if you do have a question, go ahead and throw it out there because we're just going to move right along. Um, I am a I am a researcher and have a lot of numbers in my head about um, what we what we are experiencing here in the United States with Islam and um, the the changes that a lot of people are seeing in the philosophies of Islam because there's a lot of different um, different opinions about you know what is jihad is that is that a spiritual war or is that a physical war? You've got one, one group over here saying, no, 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 that's an internal war um, versus the traditional understanding of jihad, which is actually external and meaning actual war. Um, and that really is the interpretation. Um, it has migrated over to what I've uh, what a lot of people have started to kind of see a little bit of what we call Chrislam, uh, like this taking Islam and principles of Christianity and trying to meld them together into a peaceful coexistence. Yeah, I, I see some people kind of shaking their head, but um, in understanding that this is a very common philosophy that we're seeing happening, which is a, is a big deception. Um, you know, this, this idea that we can just coexist and, you know, you have your set of beliefs and we have a lot of good commonalities, you know, the, the reverence of God and, um, you know, Jesus is a favored prophet, you know, he did miracles, we believe, we believe in the virgin birth, all of these wonderful things, but when you get down to 
the bare bones of it all, the, the, the crux of the thing is Jesus being the son of God and being God. And that's where the whole thing sort of explodes. <laughs> so, um, but it's getting to the point in relationship with your Muslim friends where you can have that conversation without it exploding. And that's the biggest issue is that right now, you know, everybody wants to sit and do apologetics with Muslims and, you know, talk about your, your ideas versus my ideas and, and how we think and versus what the word of God said versus what the Quran said. And you can go all day long. In fact, I was just sitting with a young man on Tuesday afternoon and he wanted to apologetics me all day long. But, and I was like, you know what, man, we can sit and talk about this, but it's not going to change anything. This is what happened to me as a Muslim. This is what I experienced in my heart. This is what I know. And um, so just as my dad gave his life to Christ when I was 15 years old, and I went further into Islam and decided that I needed to figure out what it was that um, um, and, uh, and so I'm just reading a question. Sorry. <laughs> How did that friend at work, which you mentioned, influence your decision to accept Christ? That's towards you, dad. Um, I don't know if you're seeing that question, but, um, and the question is, is how did that friend at work, which you mentioned, influence you to influence your decision to accept Christ? And um, my friend? Yeah, you're Charlie, basically. No. Uh, Charlie really, uh was not the influence point because he was trying to tell me that Jesus was the son of God and he's God. And I totally rejected that and I was gonna leave the room. And then he brought the Bible and began to read to me from the Bible. It was brand new Bible he took out of a box. And when, when uh, he opened the Bible, it was randomly opened and he was going to look for a page, then he stopped and I look, he looked and he started smiling and began to read to me. So obviously the Holy Spirit was really already in there and was guiding Charlie in order to, to read to me in the beginning was the word. And what I was hearing because of my Islamic understanding, uh, the, the Islam teaches the the uh, that we believe that Jesus is the word of God and the spirit of God and so when Charlie was reading to me in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God what I was hearing it says in the beginning was Jesus and Jesus was with God and Jesus was God and I lost conscience at that moment I was shaking violently and then lost conscience the next I know I'm on my knees with my hands lifted up, inviting Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Charlie shared with me later on uh, that when that when he said, when I started reading the word to you, you started shaking violently. Then you were taken off the sofa in the air and you looked like you were fighting something. And then you were brought down to your knees and your hands were lifted up. And he said, you started speaking in a language. He said, I didn't know what you were saying. It was not English. And I was speaking to a light that was speaking to me and saying, I am Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, and that's where the influence uh, that, that brought me to Christ. It was first Jesus, uh, Charlie's love and respect for me for 19 years without sharing with me anything about his God until that moment. And uh, I hope you'll take time to read my books and, and see more what's, uh, you know, the hour is not enough really to explain a lot, so. I just put in the, um, in the uh, comments, the name of the book is, uh, which is his testimony, Once Near a Fat Man. Um, if, you've, if you've read it, leave your comment about it and kind of give us an endorsement to everybody in the room who hasn't. Um, but and in the in the meantime when that was happening i was 15 and god was um basically he was on he was it was like the hounds of heaven were at the heels of our family basically because my older brother 
had already given his life to Christ four months prior to my dad and had hid it from, from our family because he knew that if he converted and shared it with my dad, he, he honestly didn't know what my dad would do. Um, if he would kick him out of the house, if he would disown him, what? So he, he didn't share with my dad that he had given his life to Christ until my dad shared with him what happened to him. And that's when he was able to come clean and share his own salvation um, story. And so um, then, you know, my mom, who is an American and was born and raised in the United States, wonderful, you know, Midwest Irish Catholic family. Um, so she had a faith in her Catholicism. And so when dad uh, started taking us to a non-denominational charismatic church, it was definitely a walk for her as well. <laughs> and so, um, but it didn't take long for her to realize that this was the truth. This, this, the second birth understanding was the truth of who God is and that Christ was so much more than just a symbol on a cross or, you know, a, um, the, uh, sacraments every Sunday or whatever. And so, um, she gave her life to Christ for about a month and a half after my dad did. And I held out for one year, almost to the day. <laughs> so, um, it shows you how much she is like me. Yeah. <laughs> Love her. So, um, but for me, and I want to answer that question because for me, it was Christians. It was relationship with that were, they were all out. They were not afraid of their faith. They were not afraid to show me their faith. And they were not afraid to say that they didn't have the answers because I would come at them. They were my youth pastors. And I would come at them with all of these questions because I'd be going home and just kind of looking at the Quran and going, okay, well, what about this? And, you know, and really, honestly, I didn't have a deep faith in Islam. Um, I barely knew what it meant because I was born and raised here in the U.S. My dad was not very practicing. And, um, and so, you know, I didn't, wasn't really truly raised in the in the um, traditions of Islam and all of those things, but we were not allowed to go to church. We didn't, you know, we didn't engage with the Christian world except at school. And, um, you know, kids would ask me, well, what did you do this Sunday? And I'd say, we went to a movie. And, well, what church do you go to? I'm Muslim. And that was usually the end of the conversation because <laughs> mm -hmm. at that time, there weren't really many Muslims. There weren't really many Arabs in Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we're talking about, you know, the 80s and early 90s. And so, um, so it was kind of a foreign thing. So I, here I am diving into my, my relationship. So um, trying to figure it all out. And so it was the youth pastors who said, you know what, I don't have the answers. I don't know Islam. I don't know anything about Islam. But what I do know is this, and they would share the word with me. They would share their testimony with me, all the things that God has done for them and, and all the things that, you know, he has walked with them through. Cause I was going through some major things at, at, you know, in your teenage years, it, it's just hard. And, um, I didn't have a lot of friends. We moved around a lot. So I was just a very lonely challenged, challenging kid, you know? And so, um, they get, they didn't stop. They didn't stop. They always engaged and they didn't shy away from my tough questions and they didn't make up answers when they didn't have them. They said, you know what? I don't have an answer to that, but I will find it for you or I will find somebody who can answer that question. Um, and so they won me by their authenticity. They won me by their willingness to, um, to walk with me through the questions and be okay if they couldn't answer them and be okay if they didn't win the argument that day. Um, and so really it came down to one day, I hadn't read the Bible. And actually I was just talking about encountering a young man who is a Muslim. And I asked him the other day because he was trying to apologetics me. And I said, so have you read the Bible? And he goes, no, I don't need to. I was like, really? Because how do you argue both sides and not really know, you know what the other side thinks? truly within context. He's, well, I know some verses. I said, but do you know context? And so that kind of shut him down really quick. But um, I didn't want to read the Bible when my pastor or youth pastor asked me to, because I had been around them enough to know that the word of God is powerful. And um, 
that I couldn't argue that. I could argue them, but I could not argue the words on the page. Because even in Islam, the, the Bible, even though they say it's been, you know, the New Testament and all of that has been corrupted and all of these things, it was not the same. I, when, I, when I read the Bible, when I finally gave in and read it, it was not the same as reading the Quran. It was not the same. And there was power in those words. And um, it was, like I said, about a year later that I gave my life to Christ. So um, the, the, main, the main purpose that we, we went, okay, how do we take all of, this, all of this experience that we have? We have 20 plus years, and then we have other volunteers who are missionaries coming off the field, who've been on the field in the Middle East for many, many years, who are joining us and um, adding to our pool of um, advisors and volunteers to help Americans get enough guts to really take the step out, to go across the lawn to that Muslim neighbor and realize that, the, that it's time to start the conversations, it's time to start the friendships and dive into a culture that may be uncomfortable um, because it is so important because you know right now there's about 3.4 almost three and a half million muslims in the united states and by birth rate alone there will be 8 million by the time 2050 comes around and you at first we think okay well that's 30 years from now that's not very long when you think about it um you know there's so many opportunities in muslim ministry not just in our neighborhoods but also online more and more are doing um, online ministry because you know countries that we that have been closed off for so many years like what we're we've been watching the um the abraham accords and all of these countries that are that are joining into these accords and becoming more and more open to the world and it's time to take this opportunity to get going to get inspired and get going and lead with love for us is really not about arming you with a ton of information in order to be a really great apologist because apologetics there are people who are talented and are called to do that but i guarantee you i would say probably about 80 percent of us are not called to that what we are called to is relationship and friendship and love and unconditional love and so that's what lead with love is about is giving you enough information enough about culture enough about all the different things that you might encounter in order to be comfortable enough to finally make that step over into you know your muslim friend invite your muslim friend from work to lunch to you know how to start those conversations how to um how to weave bible stories into your normal conversations with them when they're when you're finally building enough relationship where they want uh they're going to share their life with you their struggles um you know what's going on at home all of these things how can you take the word of god and weave that in seamlessly to conversation and bridge that spiritual bridge so that it's not just you and you and them all the time sharing your your Christianity, their Islam, and everything's good and nothing ever gets anywhere and you never get to share the gospel. You have to be able to bridge that spiritual conversation comfortably and not, because I think a lot of Christians, we kind of go, well, do you know Jesus? And then we kind of sort of like brace for impact, you know, or, you know, because we don't know how they're going to react or we don't even want to bring it up because we don't know if they're going to react well, you know? But most Muslims will be gracious, you know, they'll be gracious to hear and might even engage. Um, and some of them will probably engage in an argument, but the best thing you can do is to build relationship and authentic relationship. And um, so the, the, the world of Islam is, is rapidly changing. Um, there was a study recently with um, Islam, uh, Arab youth across the Middle East, and 80% of Arab youth are actively planning immigration out of the Middle East. They're looking to get away from this um, closed off, tyrannical type mentality and want to be free. 
And if that's the case, but the interesting thing is because of the culture and because of the way that the, the Middle East and the Arab mind is, it's very, still very family and community or, orient, oriented. So yes, they can move out of the Middle East and they can come into the Western society, but they will bring the things of the Middle East with them. And you can't, so we as Christians can't expect to extrapolate them from their culture, even though they're living here in the Midwest. We are Midwest in the, in the West. We have to go into the culture. We can't think that we can pull them out. We have to go into the culture in order to make the most impact. Because when you try to do extraction ministry, you might get one, but what about the whole family? What about having more influence into the entire community? You do that by being into their community, not trying to pull out of the community. And so um, that's another portion of what we talk about. Dad, I see you might have something. Don't let me dominate. You know I can. So... <laughs> Say what? But I see you have uh, some comments there about, um, do you have any comments to add about your own experience when you came to the West and, yeah. you know? Uh, you know, uh, when I came to the West, I naturally, I, I uh, hated Americans and America just as much as I hated Israel and the Jews. But then I came to, to the States and came to the University of Columbia, Missouri first. Didn't know why I went there, but that's where I ended up. And realized how wonderful the American people were. And that began to open my heart and my mind and decided I wanted to stay in America. Uh, now, if we look at the Muslims, uh, now the work we've done, for example, in the Gaza Strip, you know, God have given us favor to lead. Now, uh, even though I cannot go to Gaza for the last uh, 15 or 12 years, yeah, uh, Hamas attacked our operation in Gaza and I couldn't go back in. But the people that have led to the Lord, 108 of them, <clears throat> when Hamas attacks, only 78 survived that we know. The 30, uh, the other 30, until today, even their families don't know where they are. But the, gr the group increased because of what they have believed. They are increased to four, 246 or 47 now. And so multiplication have taken place through the converts at there, and we are with them on Zoom all the time, discipling them, encouraging them, building them up and uh, pray with us every morning at six, uh, at, at eight o'clock in the morning, our time, Kansas City time. We pray together until nine o'clock. Uh, then we went to, the, to Jericho, we started the ministry there and we used the same techniques we used in the Gaza Strip and God gave us favor also there. And we trained our volunteers that came from the United States and Europe that joined our ministry there. And uh, they were trained to live the gospel more than preaching it or sharing about the gospel. And that succeeded big time. And started, we started winning many of the local people to our work. And when they asked the question, our volunteers or myself or our workers, we have employed over there 43 workers that works for the ministry in uh, employed paid salaries. And, uh, and, and some volunteers that came from Europe and the United States. Also basically living the Bible or the gospel in front of them until they come to ask. And they have led several to the Lord. I have led several to, to the Lord in, in the West Bank also led many Jews to the Lord. And we have a, a big ministry called Kingdom First that we have Arabs and Jewish believers working together across culture, Jews reaching out to Muslims, Muslims reaching out to Jews. 
and and the movement is really growing quite a bit until COVID started. Then we are uh, confined, and I could not go over there all this last year. But I'm anxiously waiting to get back there. Want to make the sure work is happen. going, never stop. Even in the Gaza Strip, in the darkest places on earth, work is co going, uh, continuing, and people are still coming to the Lord in, in big numbers, actually, in the Gaza Strip because of the darkness of Islam in yeah. the Gaza Strip. Yeah. Just, and I definitely want to reiterate again, if you have questions, um, then go ahead and, and put them in the chat because I think everybody's on mute and I'm not 100% sure that I can unmute everybody at the same time. Usually I can, but it doesn't look like it's allowing me to. Um, so the, the, other, the other thing that I wanted to discuss too is um, the, the mindset and the under, and understanding the mindset of Islam and understanding, you know, there, that there's what we call the Islam in front of you. Um, you know, there are, there are like my dad who are immigrants and they came straight from the Middle East and, you know, or wherever and bring Islam with them. Then you have kids like me who were born here, raised in Islam, but have a very mixed up culture. You get, you have Western culture outside your house, you know, Muslim culture inside your house and you're just trying to figure it out. And then of course you've got your, your um, students, your international students, which I'm sure everybody might, well, not totally sure, but 80% of international students never see the inside of an American home. And um, that's a huge opportunity lost in order to be able to give the gospel to a group of people that more than likely will go home and take it with them. And if they're discipled well, will then have the, have the gumption to spread the gospel where they're going. Now, a lot of them, I will say, especially in certain countries, they come to the U.S., get their education and don't go back because they don't want to go back. And like I said, the, there's a lot of young people across the world that are, are actively seeking to get out of the Middle East. And 80% um, is huge, especially when your, your understanding is, is that um, of the Muslim world, the median age is 24. And um, about 60, I think the, the number is that it's like 65% are under the age of 24 in the Muslim world. That's everywhere in the Muslim world. That includes, you know, Southeast Asia, all of those things. Um, um, and Josh is asking, do you have any, um, do you have any suggestions on how to do that effectively? One thing that we use is, um, what we use in our training is DBS. Um, I've only got a few people that are here. So if you know DBS, shake your head, discovery Bible studies and topically, um, it goes, it comes down to being able to have the ability to take the stories of the word and put them in your own words for and knowing all different topics. And so that's kind of what, we'll, what we do is take a look at topical DBSs and, and challenge our participants to study one of those um, stories a week, get it down so that it's in your head so that, and then praying that God is going to give you the opportunity to use that within, um, uh, use that within your relationships, because we all know that the, the Bible speaks about every situation in our lives. The word of God is applicable to everything. So if you have your word memorized better than anything else, then you have the ability to speak truth quickly. And um, Muslims love, and, and honestly, I will say, I want to say Muslims, but just the honor shame culture 90% of them are very much story cultures and really enjoy story. And a lot of our missions um, partners that are coming off the field, that is the biggest thing that they share when they teach is that being able to take, you know, the story of the woman at the well 
and um, talk about when you're sitting with your, say a Muslim woman, woman to woman, and you're having conversation and maybe in that conversation, she's expressing feeling, you know, not worthy or just um, not seen or, cause that is very, very common for, for Muslim women is the fact that, I mean, they're covered, they're constantly having to um, take care of their, of themselves and everyone around them, you know, cause that is what the covering is about. They are to cover themselves because they are to make sure that no man slips into sin because of them. And so there's this heavy burden carried. And, but also Islam teaches that they're not even a full person, they're half a person. So being able to share how, how Jesus, who they know and agree is a prophet, sees this woman and sees how broken she is and, you know, and still chooses to spend time with her and talk to her and minister to her and tell her everything that she is and yet still says, come to me. And being able to, to have those scriptures in your mind and being able to use them situationally is very important. Um, um, let's see, David said, my wife and friends have been friends with international Muslim students and their parents, including that's fantastic that you've hosted. I'm so excited that you have and that you've had their parents even in your home. That's awesome. Um, and being invited to weddings. Yes, this is awesome. Like mm -hmm. this is what we're talking about. You just immersing yourselves in the cultures and some of it can be really uncomfortable because let's, you know, I, and if you want to put it in the chat too, like what are some of the areas of Muslims that you have seen? Cause there are some that are, you know, Islam is everywhere. It's Pakistani, Southeast Asian, um, even countries you wouldn't even think of, um, you know, Burma, all of those places that you wouldn't even think of that you, in our minds, we think are like, um, that are like gods. Um, what is that polytheistic? So, but there is trickles of Islam in all of those places. And so, um, uh, this lady, uh, whoever are we being too timid? Saying, I feel we have friendship down. Uh, yes, probably uh, 10 years. Uh, not everyone that we have come across and build a relationship, we were able to win them for Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a fact that we have to live with, uh, but just be continuously uh, 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 diligent and continue to show them love and acceptance. God's time is God's time, not our time. Praying for them is, is a key. Yeah, uh, I believe uh, people that we have prayed for 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 a period of time have have come uh, they will ask questions they will ask you question about your faith they will uh, that's when you really uh, uh, be prepared and be ready to share stories from the bible yeah. that relates to the relationship that you are having with them so don't be discouraged that you don't win every person that you come across. That's, you know, that's, uh, that's not what we are saying. We have won many to the Lord, but so many others that uh, right. were not able to reach them. And that's true. I mean, it, we, we know that as believers that sometimes we, we might sow into an area, but somebody else is going to harvest it, you know? So just being open to even just sow is a big deal because there's, not a lot of people. I mean, when you look at the statistics and there's one missionary per half a million Muslims in the world, that'll tell you something, you know, there, you just have to be willing to go and build that relationship. So, you know, I would say that, yeah, maybe it is time you ask the Lord to, in the Holy spirit, to give you those opportunities. Maybe it is time to ramp it up. I don't know. Yes. Um, and ask him for those cues that. Share with them something about, about Samid, honey. What's that? Uh, share with them about Samid. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. Samid, and actually our Islam teacher for our course is a former um, imam. He is a young man who came as a student to the United States and um, to finish his degree, but he was also placed to be an imam of a local uh, mosque. And he's 
kind of an apologetics guy for Islam. And so he thought that if he joined a Chi Alpha campus ministry and he could argue the Christians on campus, then um, he would win some of them to Islam. But they basically loved him so well <laughs> and prayed for him that he could not argue their realness with God. He could not argue the love that he felt with them and the difference that he saw in their lives and the joy that they had. And eventually they won him to Christ. And so um, he is still here in the United States. He still works with, he's working with us. He works as an engineer um, in the US is going to be marrying a young woman in the summer. Um, who is a believer and has gone through discipleship and is continuing to do discipleship. So, you know, it's not to say that it will happen fast or it will take years, but don't give up. Definitely give keep up. praying. And, and I would say that if you haven't introduced more of your, um, your believing friends and really tried to acclimate them even in further into your life so that there are other influences um, and other voices, that can be heard, that would be a good thing because, you know, it, it may not even be an issue of you not even communicating the gospel. It may just be that, like I said, another person needs, to, will be the one to harvest it. Yeah. But what you've yeah. planted for 10 years is undeniable. So don't, you, you've done a great job. Um, and they know truly what, what the love of God is. Um, you know, so there are so there's not really one right or way to go right or wrong way to go about it. It's really about entering in being in a prayer, consistent prayer life with uh, for your Muslim friends and asking God for those opportunities. I think sometimes we think we just kind of willy nilly enter and enter to the relationships um, and just kind of go out there to win souls. But really, we need to strategically pray for the, the persons of peace. That's another thing that we talk about. The ones who are ready, the ones who are ripe, the ones who are going to hear the stories, who are going to be, be willing to do the DBSs without even them knowing you're DBSing them, you know, sort of a deal. And so um, being in strategic prayer is important. That's why we have our prayer team on um, every morning at 8 p.m. in this or 8 a.m. in the central time zone. Um, and I'll leave our website um, address in the bottom if you want to check it out. Um, not trying to plug anything other than that. We have one minute left. Yeah, I we want have one to minute. Encourage them. So, any want, sorry, Dad, go ahead. A seed is important. What's that? Um, my, I said planting a seed is important. Yeah. Planting the seed is way more important. And then because the Holy Spirit is going to be the one to work that seed, grow the seed. And then either you are the right person or the next person that comes along is the harvester. Um, I definitely, again, I wish I could turn on um, microphones so that we could hear if you can, can everyone turn on their microphone or do I have to ask them to unmute? Um, if you have questions, go ahead and leave them. I'm gonna leave um, my email address. Um, if you want to reach out about Lead With Love, um, we are starting, we're starting our course. February 2nd um, is our first live session, but you can go online um, to our website and sign up. Um, it is an eight week course. It's all online. Um, and like I said, Samit is our Islam teacher. Uh, we have another man who is our ministry teacher. I do world, uh, I do worldview and um, some different things. And then dad teaches a deep, deep walk through the Ishmael story. Um, and then we're all, all there every week to discuss. Um, so I hope this was somewhat informative um, and helpful to encourage you to keep reaching out to the Muslim community. Don't be afraid. Um, now's the time to be bold and um, just love well and um, enjoy. Oh, also we know tomorrow morning, if you're, if you're joining Mission Connection tomorrow morning, absolutely be there for Fuad. 
Um, he's a good friend of ours and he's amazing and we love um, his work. And so be blessed. Thank you and God bless. I'm ending on my side here.